Is there really a monster in Loch Ness? Does this film, shot in 1936 but lost until today, really show the creature? And does this film, shot 41 years later, mean the monster is still lurking there today? Is that what Alex Campbell has seen more times than anyone else alive? I've seen it 18 times. Mysteries from the Files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, after a lifetime of science, space and writing, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. The monster of Loch Ness is so famous that it's eclipsed all its rivals. Yet there are reports of strange and often very large creatures looming up out of at least 50 other lakes throughout the world. Lake Okanagan, Western Canada, 130 miles long, 800 feet deep, and apparently abode of one of the world's most frequently glimpsed monsters, Pogo Pogo. 63 OV country, mainly clouds today with a high from 4 to 6 degrees, the lows tonight around the zero mark. Wednesday, according to all stormy to be... Today, Ogo Pogo's the star of a phone-in on local radio station CKOV in Kelowna. Period. I like the sounds of CK. Good morning, and welcome to Ovi's Open Line program. I do believe that's what's going on in here this morning. Therese, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. We're talking about the Ogopogo uh, today. A lot of people in the, the area have seen it. The legend goes on for many years, and we'll be talking to some experts. I believe we've got Arlene Gall coming in. Arlene wrote a book on it. That's right. But well, we're going to go to the phone lines right now. Line two, good morning. Hello there. Mr. Puglis. Yes, go yes, ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, you want to know about Ogopogo? I certainly do. Yeah, okay. I had a taxi and uh, I took a passenger to the hospital and uh, and then the, I was coming down uh, Abbott Street. And I got far as uh, about here. I looked at the lake. I was surprised. I seen this thing come out of the water. Well, it's like a, like a horse's head with the kind of horns on it. Oh, he was huge, you know, standing up there. Oh, my, just like a, you know, like a big serpent. Then another fellow come behind me, and he says, what are you doing looking at? He says, I just see no Gopogo over there. And uh, he says, where, where? Over there, he says. I, I had the door open the car, and uh, stepped out just a little bit, and uh, he slipped back in the water, see? And he says, gee, look at the big, uh, big waves there. And all we can see is uh, big waves going down there to Fred's place where he had the boat, boat rental. And they disappeared, see? And, uh, and then I got all excited. I got in the car and I pulled to the willow end and I told the people, I says, uh, they were having breakfast. I just seen Ogopogo. And they says, what the heck you been drinking, eh? Line four, go ahead, please. Hello, John. How are you? I'm not too bad. Good. Are you going to give me your name? No, I'm not. Okay. Tell I me about saw, the... I saw Ogopogo off of Sarsons about four years ago. Okay, you don't want to give your name on the air. No, I don't. Uh, you've told some people, obviously. Uh, yes. Uh, are you afraid that they might think you're a little bit of a... Well, I had some strange phone calls. And... Uh... I get them every day. That's what they pay me for. <laughs> well, I don't get paid for them, so I don't really <laughs> want, to want any more, thank you. We were up on the beach having a picnic and my daughter was on the swings when I saw this creature underneath the wharf there. And when I turned around and saw it and realized that it was the legendary Ogopogo, I just freaked out. I just ran, I grabbed the baby and ran down to the beach and she, I guess I yelled over and over, that's him. She was screaming like anything. She just couldn't believe it. Her face was red. And, uh was fishing or whatever it was doing, and it was there for quite some time. 
then it straightened out and went along those poles. And as it traveled along, it just the three humps were showing, and they were from one of those end of those poles to the other in the space the three humps were. It traveled along the beach till about the corner over there, and then it turned and went straight across the lake. Now I would hesitate to go on the lake because it's such a huge thing that I think it could tip a boat over. And not being a swimmer, I would drown, so I don't... I haven't been on the lake since. All right, we're going to break from the phone calls right now and introduce to you someone that's well-known in the Okanagan Valley, Arlene Gall. Arlene has written a book on the Yogo Pogo. Good morning, Arlene. Good How morning, are you? Good morning, John. Morning, Teresa. Good morning, Arlene. How Arlene. many sightings have you documented? Literally hundreds. Mm. Literally hundreds. When was the first sighting? The very first sighting was in 1852, the first documented sighting in 1852. Okay, 1852, and it's now 1980. 1980. Do we take <laughs> it to uh, mean that there must be more than one Ogopogo? There definitely appear to be more than one. There has been a film that was made, and I think it was back in 1968. It's pretty hard not to believe when you see it right in front of your eyes. Tell us about that film this morning. The Folden film was taken in 1968 by a gentleman by the name of Art Folden. He was returning from a trip to his home in Chase. And as he neared uh, the Peachland area, he spotted an object out on the lake, and he said to his wife, look, there's Ogopogo, and she laughed at him. And he got out and started filming the creature. And what we see in the film is a large animate object moving through the water, surfacing and submerging uh, at various speeds and at various times. And it also shows the creature taking off at very high speed, producing a massive wake. And this is the footage uh, in the film that I like very much, because you see a creature just pushing water, something terrifically, with a massive wake in front, just creating uh, huge wave action. This is believability on my part. Have there been any uh, recent sightings? We've had approximately uh, seven to eight sightings this year, but we have one uh, that has been the very best sighting. Why? And it was the Rieger family. Beautiful day. The water was just as calm as glass. When I just took a look across, I could see a big wave coming. And uh, at that time, I just didn't uh, take much notice of it. And it kept coming closer. And I thought to myself, why would there be a wave coming if uh, there's no wind or anything? So I called to my son. I says, come on back here. And I says, take a look and see if you think what the heck's coming down the lake here. So he took a look at it. And he says, gee, I don't know. So his, uh, we had his grandson, my grandson was along too. And he said, hey, Grandpa, he says, that's the Ogopogo. It would have ran right into us, but we had to wheel the boat off alongside. And then it, we followed it alongside for about, oh, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And I'd say the monster was possibly 14 to 16 feet long, which was above water, sticking above about three feet. And had a, quite a hump on the front shoulders and had a hump on the back where the tail went. And I'd say the tail was par approximately Oh, probably 30, 40, maybe 50 feet, because we couldn't see the end of it. But he did have a long tail. He had four legs. And I'd say the monster weighed approximately maybe 30 ton. And, you know. his head, uh, and his head in the front was moving from side to side. Uh, it, uh, it seemed like, uh, he, like uh, he was looking for fish or, or, or feeding or something like that. And, uh, he, was, uh, and uh, he was steering up a tremendous amount of water. If I would have never seen it, I would have never believed it. And actually, I don't care if anybody believes me or not, but I, I've seen this animal, and I know it's here, and I know it's a tremendous-sized animal. That's it for today. Thank you so much for participating in the program. We're on tomorrow morning at 8.30. Have yourself a safe day. Thank you. I'm John Michaels. Bye-bye. I'm Therese Douglas. Bye-bye. Across the world, the lakes that boast monsters also attract posses of intrepid pursuers, ready to take to the water at the drop of a hat. In Loch Ness, Ivor Newby plus his amphicar. In Lake Okanagan, a midnight vigil by 60 divers in search of Ogopogo. There have been red submarines, yellow submarines, a big game hunter, forearmed with a monstrous cage. In Sweden, a trap for the monster of Lake Storsha, baited with a pig. 
and in Japan, sake to inebriate Issy, the monster in Lake Ikeda, and the reigning Miss Hibiscus to inaugurate an Issy observatory with round-the-clock surveillance. Oddly, almost all the world's known monster lakes lie away from the tropics. Even the shallow waters of Loch Ree in Ireland would appear to have a mysterious occupant. Witness the testimony of three men of the cloth in a boat out one evening in May 1960. Father Burke, Father Murray and Monsignor Quigley. We were lolling about in the boat, doing nothing hoping for a breeze to come up that we could do a bit of uh, fishing in the night rise. When suddenly, uh, Father Quigley said, do you see what I see? What do you see? Look over there, Sissy. So I looked. I think it's something on top of the water. Hump, head out of it. Uh, moving slightly to our right, slowly, and I remember saying, what the hell is it? Uh, it wasn't, if it was a fish, you'd see some kind of commotion on the surface. Or if it was a needle-like thing, you'd see a kind of wriggle, but there was no, nothing at all. It could have been the periscope of a little submarine. My reaction was one of astonishment, because I knew that it was a very large creature, larger than any fish that could have been in the lake. Afterwards, we discussed the matter and, uh, well, we agreed that it was something in the uh, nature of a large serpent. They said we had been indulging uh, too liberally or something, that we were seeing strange creatures on the water. Well, you can say quite honestly that we didn't have a single thing in the way of nourishment on that particular day. If it was a crocodile. It was a cro <laughs> an, an Irish crocodile. <laughs> but the rarely seen beast of Loch Ree is shyness personified beside the granddaddy of all the lake monsters. Here is the most unusual film of recent years for it proves the existence of a monster in Loch Ness. The loch is 21 miles long, one and a half miles broad, and 900 feet deep. The crosses on this diagram reveal where it is stated that the monster has been most frequently seen in the past. The arrowheads indicate where it has been seen on the road and shore. And this is the point our cameramen were stationed at when, after a long and arduous vigil, they actually filmed it. Through our telescopic lenses, we saw the grey waters suddenly heave as the monster cut through them with lightning speed. Climatic conditions and exposure day and night to bleak and stormy weather affected our film, which accounts for the misty results. But this is unimportant in comparison to the achievement of filming the monster itself for the first time in history. This film was taken in 1936, two years after a London surgeon, R. Kenneth Wilson, snapped the most famous Loch Ness picture of them all. Also in 1934, this strange photograph. Is it a flipper? Metal worker Hugh Gray took this after church one Sunday. And in 1951, Lachlan Stewart's classic picture of the humps. Does this dawn picture show a monster or a wave? Is this the monster's flank or just a fake? And does this 1977 picture show the monster's head and neck? Fifty years of photographs have served only to deepen the mystery, yet the eyewitnesses are insistent. In this boat, a handful of the 3,000 people who've now reported seeing the monster. Alex Campbell, water bailiff on the lock for 47 years, who believes he's seen it 18 times. Peter McNabb, a banker from Irvine who took a famous picture in 1955. Accountant Peter Smith and his wife Gwen from Luton, who in 1977 took the most recent film. I was stunned, taken aback. I shut my eyes three times to see that I wasn't imagining things. And then the head, neck, huge hump body, perfectly clear without any doubt. And I knew right away that that creature was scared because of its behavior. The head was growing like that. Quite, whoa, fantastic. 
And then I realized it realized itself. The uh, trawlers were present. As soon as the bow of the first trawler came within my line of vision, naturally it was within its line of vision. Oh, heavens. Plunged out of sight, gone. Well, I estimated the length of the body, 30 feet at least. The height of the head, neck above water uh, level, water level, six feet. And the color of the skin was gray. I saw something beginning to surface. And in a state of very great excitement, took down the camera, fitted on the long focus lens without looking at anything. By the time I looked up, this creature was showing a black, undulating, or rather a dark-colored, undulating creature, a live creature. I lifted the camera, took this shot, which was naturally rather hazy because I had to hold this long focus camera. There's camera shake, excitement, and all the rest. In the picture is the tower of Urquhart Castle. I understand it's a 40 feet high tower, which gives an excellent impression of the overall length of the monster. It's been estimated at between loosely 30 and 40 feet. Before I could get a second shot or anything else, as far as I remember, because it's all hazy now with the excitement, it was gone. Well, we were standing on the south shore of the lock, some way up here, looking sort of across the lock. Peter was looking down at an oil drum somewhere further down, and I was looking across at the castle, just having a look at it, and this thing suddenly came vertically up out of the water. Well, my first impression was of a periscope-like object which had a slight lean to it in the water, although the head part seemed to be held horizontally. Um, it appeared to rise up considerable, a considerable height, um, at least the height of a man, and it, it was, uh, I would say, a good foot thick. With the naked eye, it was just a black pillar shape with a, a rectangular-shaped head on the top. At one point, I watched it actually turn its head um, through about 90 degrees, because normally it was in profile, but the head uh, slowly turned round until it appeared as though it was either looking directly at us or directly away from us. Uh, and when it did this, it appeared to be the same thickness as the neck. It, it disappeared as a separate entity, and then it turned back again the same way as before. I've no doubt that the eyewitnesses have seen and indeed photographed something quite real. But it could have been a skull of fish, the wake of a boat, seabirds, a seal. Many possibilities have been suggested. The trouble is, it's very easy to be mistaken. For example, this looks like the most famous Loch Ness monster photo ever made. But actually, it was taken right here. We're at the entrance of Trincomalee Harbor. Believe it or not, an elephant used to swim across this opening. And the island on the right is called Elephant Island for that reason. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting that any of the Loch Ness sightings were due to swimming elephants but this does show how easily it is to be mistaken. But for all that, for half a century, the lure of Loch Ness has inspired men to hunt for the monster. Most dedicated of all the sleuths, Tim Dinsdale, once an aeronautical engineer, now a veteran of 20 summers living afloat on the loch, with some classic monster tales in his locker. I saw an object about 250 yards away, as near as I can guess, uh, which came out of the water, Sort of, at first I thought it was a cormorant's neck, but then, you, of course, you could see that it wasn't a cormorant because it was too big, and it came out like a, like a black snake, like a black anaconda, that's what it looked like. It came out of the water like that, and then it went down, and there was a boil of white foam. And then it broke surface once again with a boil and went on. I didn't see it again. Very quick seconds, but it was real. And it had a startling effect on me, as it does, I think, when you get moderately close to these things, it suddenly becomes tremendously alive. And the first thing I did was put my life jacket on. You see, I don't normally wear one because you can't live in them, quite frankly. I've got them around. But the first thing I did was put it on. Dinsdale's lonely vigil on the loch began on April the 23rd, 1960. He was driving along the shore when something caught his eye. And I saw this immense, extraordinary object. It looked like a back of a huge animal, reddish-brown. It stood two or three feet out of the water, four or five feet across probably nearly as long as this boat, quite motionless, reddish-brown and a blotch on the left flank, which I could see very clearly. And then, while I was watching it, it started to move. 
A most electrifying moment. This huge thing started to surge away across the water. And I turned the camera and I shot about 40 feet of black and white film at extreme range, but nevertheless, it was on film. This hump going across the water made a huge glassy wake, no prop wash visible. And then it approached the far shore and then turned through 90 degrees and progressed under the surface, throwing up a wave which has since been measured on the film at a height of about two feet. In 1966, the Royal Air Force long range photographic experts studied the film and they said the film is not faked. It's taken from the approximately the place stated at Loch Ness, which is about 300 feet up on the shore. The object seen is neither a surface boat nor a submarine. It moves up to a speed of 10 miles an hour, and a cross section through it, a sausage slice, would be six feet in width, and as three feet of it is above the surface, they estimate will be at least two feet below. And finally, they said, they, we think it is probably animate alive. If there is a monster in Loch Ness, it now has much more than the camera to steer clear of. The high technology team led by Roger Parker leave their shoes on the shore to reduce noise when they go stalking with their ultra sensitive underwater surveillance gear. Their launch is stacked with 40,000 pounds worth of top notch gadgetry, not just cameras, but microphones, hydrophones, machines for monitoring disturbances of the mud on the bottom, and most significant of all, sonar as Roger Parker explains. It is quite famous, this particular instrument we had before us, as we did, in fact, on our very first visit to the lock, record a large animal in excess of 43 feet in length. And we had it, in fact, on this screen here for over one and a half hours. The particular um, animal that we detected, being, although it was large, had in its shadow what appeared to be a baby. And a baby, I mean a mere 20 feet. On the second sighting of two smaller ones, which was some nights later, we recorded these on 60 millimeter color film uh, during the night. But on the sonar screen, they can be seen quite closely together, uh, representing like a series of uh, joined dots, which of course is the uh, reflective pulses from the transmitted signal from the sonar transmitter. They are both uh, fairly close together, uh, as can be seen, and we firmly believe uh, by the sheer echo and by the nature of the signal we receive, they must be large animate objects. In actual fact, um, the termination of that long-term and most interesting encounter was the fact that somebody in a local yacht, presumably on holiday, was unaware of the excitement we were having and decided to use the loo at around about sort of half past five in the morning. So you gather one thing from that, that Nettie doesn't like flushing toilets. But it's American lawyer Bob Rines who has come closest to proving the monster exists using strobe cameras. When these cameras are suspended in the water and are taking pictures, normally they are rather steady because there aren't uh, very many underwater currents in Loch Ness. And we did have a, a rare episode once in 1975 when we think one of the animals started disturbing our whole rig. And it bumped into it, knocked it, turned it upside down, and the camera pointed up towards the surface, took a picture of the boat. And all of a sudden, in one frame, we took a picture. And we think that is of the open mouth and head of one of these animals. That's a picture that, that's pretty difficult to say what it is because it doesn't look like what most zoologists expected uh, from the kind of animal they, they think the Loch Ness Monster may be. But that's the data, it's the true data, and that's the picture that was taken. Then came the startling head, neck, and flipper shots of 1975. And we think we're looking at an animal that may be from 30 to 50 feet long, has a long neck, a very powerful neck, probably a small head, flippers, at least some of which are somewhat diamond-shaped, and a powerful tail. And uh, we'd like the zoologist to put the name on that. As a lawyer, I, I can quote what some of our British barristers have told us, that if the Nessie story had been a murder case, there'd have been a hanging long since.
Frankly, I'm much more skeptical of lake monsters than of sea monsters, because lakes, after all, are fairly small bodies of water, and there are plenty of eyewitnesses around them. And if these creatures come up to breathe, why aren't they seen more often? And if even the Japanese can't catch them, can they really exist? Next week, the Great Siberian Explosion.